Hello, my name is Jim Del Rosso. I am currently president of the American Acne and Rosacea Society, and it is a pleasure to speak today with uh, Dr. Diane Tibetato, who is professor of dermatology at Penn State University and also president-elect of the American Acne and Rosacea Society. As most of you, if not all of you, are likely aware, Dr. Tibetot, in addition to being a clinician who sees a lot of patients with acne, does a lot of clinical and basic science research in the area of acne and also is an authority on rosacea. But today we're going to be talking about acne, and I'd like to welcome you, Diane, to this uh, Clinical Audio Pearls. Thank you so much for having me, Jim. It's a pleasure. Well, we all know that we've learned over the years and the recycled dogma with regard to the pathogenesis of acne, which is what we're going to be talking about, taught us that there's an initial follicular hyperkeratosis that leads to the formation of a microcomedone. And from that, we see progression to a comedone, inflammatory lesion, which may be superficial and deep, and then to a stage of repair, which may lead to clinically normal skin, pigmentation, acne scarring, whatever the case may be. But what I'd like to talk, to talk to you about today is to see if you have any new information that will broaden our understanding of the acne pathogenesis beyond what we had learned in the past. There actually have been some interesting studies done fairly recently. One of them was conducted by a group in the United Kingdom, and they actually followed the progress of acne lesions over time. And they did biopsies at different points in time. And what they noted in several of the biopsies was that there was an inflammatory infiltrate around follicles prior to the development of the hyperkeratinization that leads to the formation of the microcomedone. And this was very interesting because, as you mentioned earlier, in the past we thought that there was hyperkeratinization and then over time an influx of an inflammatory infiltrate. But these studies suggest that perhaps, like other conditions, say psoriasis or others, that maybe inflammatory events might be initiating the process of lesion development. That is to say that the um, the Immune cells come into the areas of follicle, you know, possibly release cytokines. We're not sure exactly what the cascade involves. And maybe some of these processes might then lead to the um, hyperkeratinization and the formation of the, um, of the acne lesion. Do we know if P. acnes plays a role at that point in the initiation of, let's say, an innate immune response and promotion of that initial inflammation? I think the exact sequence we still don't have a handle on, but we're definitely learning more about the pro-inflammatory effects of piacnes. It used to be thought that the piacnes released lipases that would break down uh, triglycerides. That still does happen, obviously, but we thought that a lot of the inflammatory events associated with piacnes were secondary. There's been new information from Jenny Kim's group that shows that piacnes expresses toll-like receptors on this, on um, that piacnes actually can induce um, toll receptor signaling on inflammatory cells by interacting with the toll receptor on the surface of the inflammatory cells, which then cause the inflammatory cell to release cytokines. So P. acnes plays a role in cytokine release by activating the toll-like 2 receptor. And this is interesting because there may be therapeutic implications involved with toll-like receptor 2 signaling. Now, how do some of our therapies that we have had available for years influence these uh, new mechanisms that are being brought brought forward? I think what a lot of the studies uh, that have been done recently, again, many of them done by Jenny Kim's group and other groups across the world, actually, have shown that um, that certain medications such as topical retinoids can actually downregulate the expression of toll-like receptor 2 on the surface uh, of inflammatory cells. So we know that uh, retinoids have a variety of anti-inflammatory activities. They can decrease expression of the AP1 transcription factor. They can alter the, um, the migration of inflammatory cells. And we now know that they can also downregulate toll-like receptor 2 expression. So we're learning more about the treatments that we have and how they're influencing the acne pathogenesis. Now, looking at the other end of what happens down the line, it's my understanding that some of the matrix metalloproteus enzymes are involved in collagen remodeling and potentially what may happen in terms of, of acne scarring. What are some of the therapies that we have that influence some of the MMPs that may play a role in that process? Well, we know that um, members of the tetracycline family can influence the expression of, of the activity of, of matrix metalloproteinases. And things like the sub-antimicrobial doses of doxycycline have been shown to downregulate the activity of matrix metalloproteinases. 
So antibiotics that we use, um, obviously in antibiotic doses, are killing the piacnes. In, in, but in sub-antimicrobial doses, they may also be inhibiting um, the expression of matrix metalloproteinases, which may, um, which may um, alter the inflammatory response. Yeah, so it seems like some of the therapies we have may be actually working through a variety of different mechanisms and not just a, a single mechanism of action. That's right. And, and the thing that's actually interesting about it is all of the therapies are doing different things in the, in the inflammatory cascade. And it's hard to put, I think in our minds, we always want to have a sequence on these events, like this happens first, that happens second, this happens third. But a lot of work that we've done with biopsying active acne lesions and doing gene array expression analysis on it shows that many of these processes are happening simultaneously within the scan. So you can have a high upregulation of matrix metalloproteinases, which, as you mentioned, are breaking down the matrix, which actually may be leading um, to healing of the lesion. So the matrix metalloproteinases can cause tissue destruction, but in some cases, tissue destruction might be part of the healing process. So it, I think we definitely need to do a lot more research to try to get a handle on what the sequence of these events are in terms of leading to a greater resolution and quicker resolution of acne lesions. One of the questions I have is we know that uh, reactive oxygen species have uh, potentially played a role in, in photo aging and photo damage and also potentially in rosacea. Is there any role that's been identified potentially in acne vulgaris? Yeah, there were there were some interesting studies that looked at the expression of superoxide dismutase, which is the enzyme that's responsible for helping to break down um, oxidative uh, damage, oxidative free radicals and looking at the expression of malonyl dialdehyde, which is a lipid peroxidation product in patients um, in, with acne. And they found that those with acne, and the same type studies were done with rosacea, they had um, increased levels of reactive oxygen species uh, in the skin. They had uh, lower levels of the superoxide dismutase enzyme and higher levels of the malonyl dialdehyde. So there may be some evidence for oxidative damage in acne, but this is really an area that we don't um, have a cause and effect uh, relationship um, drawn yet, and we really don't have a good handle on the role, if if any role, of antioxidants uh, in the treatment of acne. But it's a very interesting area, and I think definitely worthy of additional study. Other than what we have already learned about uh, P. acnes, is there anything new in, uh, with regard to what P. acnes might be doing that's operative in acne vulgaris? Yeah, actually there's some very interesting recent work done, again by Dr. Jenny Kim's laboratory, that shows that P. acnes can actually influence the differentiation of dendritic cells. So in the presence of P. acnes, um, macrophages can differentiate into a subtype that actually acts to phagocytose the P. acnes um, at a better rate. So it's interesting that the P. acnes can cause dendritic cells to then go ahead and attack the P. acne. So it's a very interesting process that the body has in terms of its its response to the P. acne bacteria. So P. acne can be a little suicidal, it sounds like. That's what it sounds like. <laughs> That's what it sounds like, which which would be a good thing. But uh, some of the, the questions that we're interested in, and I know a lot of others are interested in, and there's, there's work um, by Dr. Gallo's group on P. acne vaccines, is, um, you know, what are the differences between patients? Why do some patients have acne? Why do others not have acne? Why do some patients with really high levels of P. acne don't have acne? Um, the majority of patients with acne do have elevated uh, levels of P. acne, but, um, you know, what's the immune response to P. acne? How does one patient differ from another? And what changes over time? Um, you know, P. acne can still be quite high on pe uh, people's skin, um, for several years after the acne is resolved, yet um, you know we don't really know why that is. So there's clearly something going on with the immune response to P. acne that that we don't quite understand. So we get more information and we raise more questions. Exactly, that's, that's kind of the need, way it works. <laughs> we need people like you. Now I know you're a sebophiliac. You, that's right. You do a lot of work with sebum. Is mm -hmm. there any uh, anything going on in that particular area uh, with sebum production and acne that? That, that you've uncovered or others that you work with have uncovered that are helpful for the listeners to know? Well, I think that's the, one of the biggest challenges that we have in acne treatment is uh, we know that sebum production is part and parcel of the acne process. We only have isotretinoin and hormonal therapy in women that reduces um, the production of sebum. So there's a lot of interest in finding novel compounds that can reduce sebum. 
Um, one of the approaches we've been taking to this question is we've been looking at trying to determine how it is that isotretinoin has its super potent effect on reducing sebum production. So we've done a lot of work in this area. We found that isotretinoin can induce apoptosis in sebocytes. Uh, we found that isotretinoin can induce a protein called NGAL, which then can lead to apoptosis. So we're very interested in finding alternative ways to induce apoptosis and maybe alternative ways to turn on this NGAL protein in the skin that may lead, um, that may lead to apoptosis of the sebaceous gland specifically and reduction of sebum. There are a lot of other um, compounds. If you look at, at meetings, there's some small molecules that are being uh, investigated in a variety of areas. So I'm hopeful in the future um, that we might be able to have some novel agents that could affect sebum production. Well, Diane, we certainly want to thank you for your time and want to thank you for all the work you do both on the basic science and, and clinical research. And, and thank you for this uh, great discussion today. Great. Thank you, Jim.